today, on this great Lord's Day. Uh, don't know if you heard about the DEA officer. That's drug enforcement officer, if you didn't know what that was. And, and in that uh, field, he went to a particular rancher's field. And the rancher was there building fence. And the agent walked up to the rancher and he flipped out his badge and said, I'm a DEA agent, I'm going on your property, and I'm going to search to make sure there's no drugs growing on your property. Well, the farmer was going to be obliging, but he wanted to make sure he warned the guy of his dangerous, big, bramer bull that he had on his property. So he tells the guy, look, yeah, you go, I just want to be sure to warn you. Look, you don't warn me of nothing. You see this badge? This says it all. This says I represent the U.S. government. I can go when I want, where I want, how I want. Yeah, but I just want to take, no, you don't tell me anything. This badge does the talking for me. When people see this badge, they do what I say, when I say, whenever I say. Farmer said, have at it. So he goes across the field and begins to investigate. It ain't long later, you hear this blood-curdling scream, and off coming across the pasture is this DA running as fast as he can with a Bramer bull whose horns were about 10 inches behind his back, and he's trucking it. And there's not a fence and there's not a tree anywhere around as he screams going across the pasture. Rancher drops his tools, goes up to the fence and says, Your badge! Show him your badge! <laughs> so. <laughs> so. In life, a lot of situations we think because of our education badge, our mental badge, our experience badge. Life comes along, we flip it out. So I got my badge, and that doesn't do it. Because our wisdom and our experience and our intelligence does not cut it when it comes to life's situations and decisions we need to make. We think it does, but it doesn't. And we keep flipping out that badge, wondering why things are going bad when they ought to be going a lot different than what they are. And so this morning, we're going to look at a passage that I've entitled, The Great Deception. Now, most people would look at this passage and say, Brother Tim, that's not a good title, because it's not about deception, it's about sowing and reaping. It ought to be reap to sow, sow to reap. You know, you need to have something on there related to that, because it's not about deception. But that's how this passage starts. And I think we fail to see that the beginning of it tells us so much about the whole passage. If we get time, we'll have uh, verse 10. If not, we'll, we'll hit 7 through 9 this morning as we look at these particular areas. First of all, the problem. It's found in verse 7, and as we see, this is where the title comes up, because most people jump over these words, and they go right into the sowing and reaping. Say, so i got to get into this passage to see about sowing and reaping. And they fail to see, it starts out saying, do not be deceived, because what he's about to tell us is to help us be, or to get undeceived, so to speak, to quit being deceived. God is not mocked. So deception is key. So Brother Tim, we're Christians. We don't, we're not deceived. Well, even James makes it clear in James 1, 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. That's Christians. As a matter of fact, Galatians was written to the church. So don't, none of us should be up here today saying, I am not deceived because I'm a Christian. Because it's clear here he's saying not to be as if there are people who are deceived. Now, for the definition, if you say you're not deceived, you do understand that part of the definition of deception is you cannot know about it. Right? It would not be in its definition deception if you knew about it. Because as soon as you find out you are, then you quit being deceived. So, you say, Brother Tim, are you deceived? I don't know. Neither do you unless you read the Word of God because in and of myself I can't see some things that I'm being deceived in. That's why it says don't be deceived. Meaning I have the capability and you have the capability of being deceived even as I speak. It's a prayer of mine quite often to say, Lord, 
please show me my blindness. Show me my deception. Because if you don't show it to me, and if your word doesn't reveal it to me, I won't ever know it. And I'll live my life in deception. Now, I believe personally that deception is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, thing that challenges folks on earth, whether they're lost or saved. I believe that it's something that we all face and it's something that has to be taken very, very serious. Now, we know about deception. Have you thought about almost all team sports are based on deception? You probably never thought of that. Wow, football. What is your goal? It's for me to go up here to the line and make people think it's going to be a run, and we're going to pass. Right? And when you are running, you want the guys to think you're going to go right, and what do you do? You go left, but you fake left or right. You fake the way you're not going right, so they'll be deceived. That's the whole art of it. Basketball. You want them to think you're going to dribble left, but you're going to dribble right. You're going to think that you're getting ready to pass, but you're going to shoot. You may look like you're going to shoot, and you're going to pass. You may look like you're going to pass it to this guy, but you throw it to this guy. It's the art of deception. Baseball, you want him to think you're going to throw a fastball, you're going to throw a curveball. I mean, it's deception. That's how, if you're a good sports person, you are a good deceiver. I mean, look at those guys that really are great running backs. Man, they know how to dart and all that stuff. Hunting, it's all based on deception. You hide, you hide in blind, you deceive the animal. When you go fishing, what do you do? It's all deception. I'm going to throw them something that they'll think is food, but it's got hooks on it and they're kind of hidden. So the whole art of fishing is based on deception. So we know what deception is. We see it in sports, we see it in hunting, we see it in fishing. So it's evident to us. I mean, that's why hunters put out decoys. And so these decoys, you know, people, the birds coming across or whatever, say, hey, look, there's some more ducks. We're having a party down there. They fly in. That's not a party. That's a deception. That's what it's all based on, to deceive. And so we know who the great deceiver is. It's our enemy, the devil and Satan, who deceives the world. He's a, he's a great one. He knows how to do it. He does it well. He deceives well. And think about it for a moment. His greatest deception is this. I want people to be so deceived, they think they're going to heaven, and they won't. That's it. Oh, it's his great one. Because most people, you ask, are you going to heaven? Sure. Going to heaven? Sure. And Satan wants you, if that's not true, he wants you to keep being deceived to think it is. That's his greatest deception. His other deception is, once you are saved, to help you be deceived into doing what God wants you to do. That will be the greatest blessing to you and I. And so that's his, that's his game. That's, that's how he operates. That's his motive of operation. And that's what he continually does in the hearts. He knows he can't get us in hell, but he can make, try to make our lives as much like that as possible by keeping us deceived. You think that's not bad enough? We're a deceiver of ourselves. Think, why would we do that? Jeremiah makes it clear. The heart is more deceitful than all else. You can't find anything more deceitful in your heart. And is desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Well, you want to know the most deceitful thing in the whole planet? It's my heart. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Thinketh in his heart. So part of my, my whole mental process is my heart. So as a man thinketh in his heart. So how I think and how I reason is very deceitful. So if I sit down for a decision, I say, okay, uh, I'm going to think this through. This, this, and this. Here's how I'm going to make my decision. You better not just do that. That Your heart and your thinking can be very deceitful, and our hearts are desperately wicked. So I can't trust my own intellect, my own education, my own experiences. I can't trust that. I can only trust the Word of God and His Holy Spirit. And I don't know how many decisions I've made that's been wrong because I said, this looks like the right one to me. I know you've never done that and find out, that was the worst one. How did you do that? 
because I was deceived. I used this instead of this. And I made a bad one. Well, I was deceived. And you get deceived, but we should not be deceived. Matter of fact, the prouder we get, I believe the more deceived we get. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. I know, Brother Tim, I can make my own decisions. I'm my own man. But you're your own man, but you're deceived. Because even in our arrogance, we try to deceive ourselves because we get proud and say, hey, it doesn't matter. I'll do it the way I want to do it. And then that word mocked is a Greek word that has to do with turning your nose up at somebody. You ever had somebody do that? You know what they're telling you. I know, I know better than you do. And of course, it's not literally many times they turn their nose up, but that's what this word means. It's just, it's mocking somebody. It's just saying, I know better than you. And that's what we do to God. You know, Ernest Hemingway, which many of you are familiar with, the, the great author, the, I say great in the sense that maybe he could write well, but that's about it. He loved to mock God. And everybody looked up to Ernest Hemingway because of his great writing, but he was he's infamous about mocking God and saying that it didn't matter how he lived. There was no consequences to his behavior. Matter of fact, he loved to mock the Lord's Prayer by saying this, Our nada which art in nada, which nada being a Spanish word for nothing. Our nothing which art in nothing. Just to blaspheme and mock God. Well, he may have been famous, but his Ernest Hemingway's life ended in despair and he put a bullet in his head. So he didn't mock God. He may have mocked him in and there, but you understand, this is always true. And his nada, which ought not have got him nada, because he didn't have the life that he should have lived. I'm t always I'm reminding my children that when they need to make a decision, that guess what? God has never been wrong once. Do you realize that? Nobody can say that. Nobody in here can say, you know, I've never been wrong once about anything. But you know what? God has never been proved once on, wrong on anything. Not one scripture, not one prophecy, not one command, not do it this way and it'll work out this way, not do this and it'll work out right. He's never, ever been wrong. And we mock him, saying, I'm not going to do that scripture. I'm not going to do that. That's not for me. That's not the way I understand that. I'm not going to be fully committed. I'm not going to be on fire for the Lord. I'm not going to do that. When we do that, we mock Almighty God and say, I know better than you. I know what you say, but. But what? I'm going to do it my way. And so we just mock God because we're so deceived by thinking we know better than God. And so deception leads us to mocking a holy God. Boy, I, I never thought of it as I began to study how much my decisions, when I make them apart from God, I just mock God. And how tragic that is. The second thing is not only the problem, the next deal is the principle. For whatever a man sows, this he also reaps. There's the deception. What? That people don't believe that. People believe that they can do whatever they want and make the decision whatever they want and think they got away with it. And that's deception. And then he goes on to this deception to talk about how we live our lives. And of course, we've seen this in regard to giving, but let's look at it in regard to behavior with deception in mind. In other words, let's look at it as our actions, not our money, and let's look at it and it can't apply, obviously, to money. But let's look at it as, as actions. First of all, number one is, you are deceived, and I'm deceived, if you think you will not reap what you sow. Job said, according to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble, they harvest it. He said, Brother Tim, I got away with this last... <laughs> You're deceived. See? Because if you plan it, that behavior, it comes up. It's going to come up. Why? Because the Bible says it is. And if you say it's not, you mock God. You're deceived. It, it's going to happen whatever we, whatever behavior we sow, it's going to sprout up later on in a harvest. And of course, we know the second principle. 
And we're deceived when we think that we will not reap more than what we sow. Hosea said, For they sow the wind, and they reap the whirlwind. So no matter if I sow good spiritual seeds or my bad fleshly seeds, I'll always reap from my behavior much more than that that'll come up. That's a principle. Think about it this way. If you sow a thought, you reap a behavior. If you sow a behavior, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap character. If you sow character, you reap a destiny. And that's how you get where you are. It all started from sowing a thought. And you said, hey, that's a good thought. I'm going to plant that. Instead of getting rid of it, I'm going to plant it. And up sprouted, sprouted a behavior. And you say, I'm going to take that behavior and I'm going to plant that. And that sprouted as a habit. You took that habit and you planted it. And that sprouted up as your character. And you took the character and planted it, and boom, that's your destiny of life. That's how people end up where they end up. It's all planting and reaping, planting and reaping, planting and reaping. Instead of we should have took that thought captive and say, you're not going to get planted. I'm going to pour poison over you and kill you because I don't even want you to germinate at all if it's a bad thought. If it's a good spiritual thought, plant it and watch it take off. We've got to be on guard for that because we're all of like nature that our flesh is weak. And then the last one is, you're deceived when you think you will not reap later than when you sow. Ecclesiastes says this, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. What does this verse say? It says the reason people do evil, not only because they have an evil nature, but because the execution of that evil deed is not executed quickly. Do you ever think about this? If you went to steal something, and every time you picked it up, your hand fell off your arm immediately, you'd quit stealing. If every time you lusted, you went blind for a day and a half, immediately. I mean, you saw something, you lusted, boom, blind, day and a half. You'd probably stop right then, wouldn't you? I mean, if everything you, 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 whatever you did, God chose right then and there to boom you, to execute it right away, you'd, you'd transform. And it says that's why people want to do evil. Because they say what? Brother Tim, I've been living the way I'm living. Nothing bad's happened to me yet. <laughs> God's not struck me dead. He's not took away my home and career and things are going pretty good. See? Deception. Because <laughs> it hadn't happened quickly. And we hadn't seen the results of it. And that's how the devil works in that deceptive way. Some people say, Brother Tim, I don't believe in those laws. I don't believe in all the Bible like y'all <laughs> or those people or those preachers or whoever. I don't believe that way. Uh, I got my own thing going. With me and God, we kind of got an agreement here. We, we know how far committed we need to get. Just listen, if I go in the Empire State Building and I stand at the top and I say, I do not believe in the law of gravity, and I jump, it doesn't matter if I believe in the law of gravity or not. I mean, I'm a pancake. If you believe the law, you don't believe the law, I'm a pancake. And so believing the law doesn't really matter. It's going to happen. It is God's law, and He is going to make sure it happens. He did it as a principle in agriculture to give us a physical illustration so that we'd know it happens in the spiritual realm as well. And so we've got to be on guard for that and know that it's God who's going to always be right in regard to His laws. Now the next thing is not only the problem, the principle, the next thing is the plan. Brother Tim, give us a plan. I mean, you've told us the problem, you've told us what the principle is, but how do we do something about it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because Galatians 6, 8, the very next verse, tells us what to do. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So you see the principle there. you got flesh gets corruption, 
you got spirit that gets eternal life. So let's look at those two because that's the choices we make. Brother Tim, I just don't make flesh choices and I just don't make spirit choices. I make choices in the middle. There is no middle. It's either a flesh seed or it's a spirit seed. That's the only seed choices. There is no C in this multiple choice test. It's only A and B. And if you're not doing the spirit, then you're doing the flesh. You say, what is the flesh? That's just anything apart from God. My own desires. What I want apart from what God wants. It's that old flesh nature that always wants what it wants apart from what God wants. It's that flesh nature that justifies every wrong that I do and say God's okay with it. It's that flesh nature that says I can do what I want to do and God's okay with it. I can justify myself with every excuse in the world. That's my flesh. We all still have it. It still wars against us. And we're either going to obey it or we're going to obey the Word of God and the Spirit that's coming that way. And it says here that in regard, and it starts out with the flesh, when I plant those kind of seeds, meaning what I want as opposed to what God wants, when I plant those, what's going to come up? Corruption. It's a Greek word that they use there that has to do with rotting food. And food, if you leave it out for a long period of time, it gradually gets rotten. Slowly gets rotten. It goes from, from better to worse. And that's what word he chose there. That if you and I plant the flesh seeds, it will lead to corruption, rottenness. Things will go from what they were to gradually being worse. That's the Word of God. And the Bible says, Let God be true and ever man a liar. I love that verse. Let God be true and ever man a liar. Because God, guess what? He's never going to be proved wrong. Never. Because He's God. But He'll prove man wrong first. You know what? I, you know, the, everything is debatable these days, is it not? I've never seen it like in my life. You think, okay, when this issue, it's going to be a 99% for, one against. And it comes up 50-50 or something. You know what I'm saying? It's like, is there no just truth anymore? Everybody has an opinion on the other side when it seems some issues are so black and white. I have never seen anybody, though, the one thing I've never seen anybody debate is if somebody holds up an apple and they say, I have no idea where this came from. Not, not talking about God versus not God. I'm not talking about atheists even say this. They know where it came from. What? An apple seed. Nobody ever debates that. They never say, hmm, let's do a scientific experiment to find out where this apple came from. It's obvious. But you know, people will argue why things are sprouting up in their life and say, I wonder if it has to do with God. Now, let's look at these two seeds. First of all, the flesh seed, I mean the, the spirit seeds. Let's do that one first. Let's, let's narrow in on that. That's what we want to be planning. We want to be planning things that the Holy Spirit wants us to do. When I was young, probably like up till probably about 10 years old, 12, my brother and I would go and spend a week or two at my grandparents' house up in Brenham. And we loved it up there. We'd spend the week, we'd hunt, we'd fish, we'd go exploring, we'd find arrowheads. We'd just, it was just a blast for a kid. We didn't have all those little game things and whatever. I mean, this, this, was, this was fun. I know y'all are saying that's fun too. But we had to be creative and use our imaginations and go. I mean, it was just fun, man. It was just a blast. And one thing I remember, though, that was even apart from all of that fun is... We knew every time we would go up there and spend that long length of time, my mom would always mail these little, I won't say care packet, that makes it sound like I'm a soldier, you know, but there's these little envelopes, little, little yellow kind of envelopes, and she'd put little stuff in there, you know, like I remember little, had a little straw, and you put little, some little gooey stuff on there, and you blow it, and it makes a bubble, and you can pinch it off. And uh, Some of y'all are too young to even know what all that. And they'd have made a little deal where you blow bubbles, you know, and blue blow bubbles, and, you know. And it was just a, it was so exciting. I know I'm kind of simple about it, but it was so exciting to, to and you have to realize this was on my grandparents' house on the dirt road. They had a farmhouse built in 1916, and, and this, and this no air condition, I mean, it was great, though, you know. And the, on this old dirt road, 
it may be five cars a day would go by. One of them was the mailman. And we knew one of those, and maybe even twice if we were there two weeks, there was going to be one of those little care packages sent there. And we'd, we'd run out to that mailbox and we'd look. Not today, but it's coming. And we'd, you know, it's just an exciting time. Even though we were doing all that other fun stuff, we'd always run. We'd see that, oh, there's the mailman. We were right up there. And man, the day it was there, boy, we'd look, hey, man, my brother would get one, and I'd get one. And maybe we'd open it up, and maybe we'd play with it. It was so exciting. And knowing maybe mom may even send another one the next day or the next or whatever and we'd run out there again. We never got one of those at home. I never waited at home for the mailman. I mean, that was all bills, I guess. I never once ran out to mail. Huh? Why? Because mom didn't do it when we were home. We had to plant the seed by going to Brenham. And when we went to Brenham and planted that seed, then we could wait. Something coming in that mailbox. See, that's how the Christian ought to live their life, in anticipation of what God's going to send to that mailbox. Whoa, I wonder what it's going to send tomorrow. What are you going to open that thing. But you hadn't planted nothing, so you can't even go there. You're still at home. You don't run to your mailbox because you hadn't planted a seed. But, boy, we planted that seed. My brother knew we, that's coming here because we're in Brenham. And, boy, we'd open that thing. Shouldn't you live it? But if you're not planting seeds, you can't run out there in anticipation and joy and excitement about what God's going to send to your mailbox. Because if you plant those spirit seed, they're coming, and they're coming quick. And then there's the flesh seeds. Those are the seeds we think, ah, this is going to be all right. I know I'll not be thinking about this and doing this, and I know this is what I want, and I know God really wants me to do this, but I got busy, and I got to do this. And we come up with all these excuses. How many of y'all get those things in the mail from Visa and American Express and all that? You know that you open them up, and man, you feel like you're the king. Mr. Strickland, you deserve the gold. Go for the gold. You know, like I'm an athlete, and I think I will go for the gold. You know, I deserve the gold. You are a great customer, and we can extend your credit to where you can be the, have the gold level. And we can extend it out this many years, and you can go up to this limit, and you deserve, you just got that little old regular one. But you need the gold one with the high limits. Enjoy life more. Live more. Love more. Have more. I mean, it looks good, man. You say, oh, yeah. It's in colored print. It's big letters. It's like, oh, 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 I think I do deserve this. And then it comes with about 1,900 pages that are so small a print, you would need a NASA microscope to read it and seven attorneys to tell you what it means. It's like, what is all of this? Look, don't hire seven attorneys. I'm going to tell you what it says. It says this. If you get this card, your life's ruined. That, that's what that says. So don't even, don't even, don't even read it. Because it says we're going to gouge you with the highest interest possible. And we're going to compound it if you're late. And we're going to take your house. And we're going to rob you for the rest of your life. And you'll never pay this off if, until you live to be 116. That's what that says. That's what that says. Because we want to bring you to corruption and we want to rot you. Now, they don't say all that big, all the big prints, good. All that stuff, and there's a reason. They, anytime you watch a commercial and say, and this is an exceptional, <laughs> or if they put something in real, just realize that's the negative part of the ad that they don't want you to hear. Say, what did that guy just say? He said it's so fast. I don't even know. That's because he don't want you. And that's what the devil does. He may even get you a little higher paying job. He may get you a little this, and he may allow this good to happen. Why? Because he doesn't want you to plant any spirit seeds. Keep planting the flesh because he wants you to not see that small print because all that stuff's going to come due one day. He don't want you to see the corruption side. He only wants you to see the good because what happens the day after you did the flesh seed? Good. Next day, good. Next day was good. Well, we go back to the other principle. It hadn't happened quickly. And so we've got to always be doing the spirit seeds. James put it this way. But be doers of the word. And not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. 
For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is, was like. For the one who looks into the perfect law, that's this, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed. That's good seed production in his doings. What James says is, if you listen but don't do, you deceive yourself. Deception. I heard that sermon. I heard what the Bible says. I listened to it. We all heard, but we don't do it. James says, you deceive yourselves. He said it's like looking into a mirror and just going on your way. Now, ladies, they have mirrors all over the place. And that's good. Us guys like our ladies look as best as they can. And so that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. I mean, they got mirrors in the bathroom. They got mirrors that stand up in the bathroom. And they got mirrors in their purse and in their compacts. They got mirrors called vanity mirrors. Go figure that one. They have mirrors that flip down. Flip down on the visor inside the car in case you left one out of your purse. I mean, there's, there's mirrors everywhere. Why? Because they're always wanting to see how they look. Why? Because that's the part of the body you can't self-examine. Up oh, there's some dirt. Up, oh, got dirt on my sleeve. Up, oh, that shoe doesn't look very good. Oh, look at my foot. Look at my knee. I can examine most of my body, but I can't tell what my face looks like unless I take your word for it. And, but if I want to look myself, i got to have a mirror. Right? That's the only way I can see how I look. Now, the Bible says that you ought to look in the mirror. Why? Because I don't know how I look unless I look in the mirror. Now, if I don't ever look in the real mirror, I say, you know, I bet I look pretty good. And then I look in that mirror and say, ugh, this ain't good. And some of the women have the things you flip over the backside and they're magnification mirrors. Have you ever looked in one of those things? That'll scare you. I mean, you may have a zit that looks the size of Mount Rushmore. Like, whoa! What's it? Flip that thing back over the other way. I don't want to see that. See, that's what you do here. Oh, man. I thought I was pretty spiritual. I thought I was pretty a good person. Oh, look at that. Oh, man, look how I look there. So Tim Strickland may say, you're a pretty good guy. But then he looks in the mirror and says, oh, man, look at that zit. Look, ooh, look at that, man, that's all messed up. And then I can do something with it. But you know why? A lot of people won't look in the physical mirror because they don't want to see anything they've got to correct. And a lot of people won't look intently. That's what the Word says there in the Scripture. They won't look intently in the mirror. And you know what you do when you do that? James says you deceive yourself because you're just hearing and not doing. We have to change that in our lives to know it. Because that's really what a lot of people... You get a lot, some people that want counseling that way. They come in with a problem that says, Brother Tim, I've got apple problems. Right? That, that's a spiritual analogy, isn't it? Not real. I've got apple problems. Can you help me clip these apples off? Can you show me a way to clip apples? Sure. You take scissors and just cut them off. Woo! Thank you, Brother Tim. Well, next week they got apple problems because they sprout back again. Brother Tim, they're back. And you just told me to tell you how to take care of the apple problem. It's going to always come back. You're just wanting help with the symptoms. If you want to have help for good, you pull that sucker up by the roots and go burn it. And let's plant, a, do you like oranges? Woo, I love oranges. Well, let's put an orange seed in there. And let's pack that down and let's get some orange growth going. See, that's what happens in our life. We just clip the symptom and it grows back. Say, so, Brother Tim, I'm always having the same. There you go. You got to take the root out and plant a brand new seed. And that's what this verse is saying. Plant seeds of the Spirit. And then, oh, I know you hate this one, I do too, patience. <laughs> patience, not only the problem and the principle and the plan, now we've got to have what? Patience? Oh, no, not that. 
Yes, that. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we reap if we do not grow weary. Matter of fact, verse 10, I didn't put it up there. It goes on to say this. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are the household of faith. In other words, we need to do good to them, and the way we're going to be able to do that is to not give up. Do you see those words that he uses? Look what he uses there. Don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. Why? Because any time we wait, we usually many times give up. We lose heart. It's been, I've been waiting long enough. You know, the word wait for some people is a four-letter word. You know, they don't want to wait. We don't want to wait. Why? In our society, it's even more difficult, isn't it, to wait? I mean, if your computer slows down from, from two nanoseconds to four nanoseconds, I've got to have a new computer. I can't wait this long. This thing is so slow. If you would have saw that computer 10 years ago, you said, this fast computer in the world. But we don't want to wait for anything. We have fast food, fast computers, fast iPhones, fast everything. And so now it comes to spiritual things, and God says, wait. Wait! And listen to this carefully. I believe much of what we don't get in our spiritual life, we would have got if we'd have waited. Because God was going to deliver and we gave up and didn't wait. Whether it was a marriage, a home, a, a church, or whatever it is, we didn't wait long enough for the answer to come. Because farmers, if you read James, farmers have patience because they have to wait on those crops to come up. And the Bible's telling us we've got to wait. We've got to wait. You know, I've often think, thought, when a good thing happens to me, I know I don't deserve it. But I've often wondered, I wonder if that's God saying that's something I planted maybe two years ago. And it popped up now. It took a long germination. And then I'm wondering sometime when some bad comes up, I wonder if it's something I planted two years ago or last month, and I'm just now seeing it come up. And I'm thinking, why is this happening to me? Well, it may have been something I planted or we planted because it says it's going to reap corruption, that we're going to have to see what God's going to do with the seed that we plant. The Lord taught me a very good lesson early in my Christian life. I'd really surrendered my life to the Lord. I wasn't going to play church anymore. I, had, I was whole hog or none racing motocross, and I was playing church like it was it could, I could do it or not do it. You know, here, there, if I want to, no big deal. But motocross, I was all into it. Just a whole hog. It's like, well, you're not whole hog doing God's work. It's kind of hypocritical. So I surrendered it to the Lord, I said, Lord, I want, I want you to have complete control of my life. And then one of my next decisions was, you know, I need to find a spiritual, a godly mate. You know, this is one of the next aspects, I believe, in my life. I'm 19, so it's, you know, I need to... And, and I wasn't having any good fortune doing that on my own. It was frustrating to me. And I'm not saying this is a formula, but I believe God used it in my life to teach me a very important lesson on waiting. I... Went to the Lord and said, Lord, I can't do that. I've not been able to I'm frustrating myself trying to find. Lord, I'm not going to date anybody, go out with anybody for one year. And Lord, would you direct me to the person? I'm just going to focus on you. And at the end of that year, Lord, would you show me? I'm going to wait on you, and you show me who I need to marry. Now, and I did that. I made that commitment. Now, I'll be up front. There wasn't a whole lot of girls waiting in line. I'm not saying that, you know. <laughs> well, really, to be honest, I don't believe any of them were waiting in line. But that's, that's beside the point. You know, it's like, Lord, I'm going to make this commitment to you. And sure enough, after one year, fourth row back, Glendale Baptist Church, I met Rebecca Ann Beach. And I wanted to be her beach boy. <laughs> and I did. Can't sing, but I became her beach boy. And God, you say, but Brother Tim, I don't like to wait. I'm not like you. I didn't say I like to wait. Did you hear me say that? I said God taught me an important lesson about, well, I hate waiting as much as you do. 
I hate it. I hate it. So I didn't say I like it. I'm saying God taught me an important lesson. Listen, that the best things, like my bride, come when you maybe had to wait the longest. And I see so many people give up and give up and give up. And I'm saying I've done that too. And I don't know how many times I and you have got robbed by not waiting on seeing what God would bring about. Whether it was in your finances or your home or your marriage or your children or something you're asking God for because the answer may be just around the corner. And some of you have waited for an answer for years. And I know some of you in this room are just what this verse says, you're growing weary. You're getting tired. And you're ready to give up. Because that crop has not come in. And you know you've planted that spiritual seed. You're believing God for that spiritual seed. You're trusting God to bring it up. And it hasn't come yet. But I say to you, wait. And wait for God, because that mailman's coming. That spiritual angel mailman's coming. And if you look for that mailbox, open that thing, it's going to be there one day because my God's faithful that says, if you pray according to my will, I answer. Because He's a faithful God. And you can be like my brother and I. You can be anticipating. I wonder if that mailman's coming today. It's going to be exciting. But how tragic it is that some Christians... They can't go to their mailbox. They can't even be anticipating their mailbox because they're not planting any spiritual seeds so that every day they can get up and every week they say, I wonder what's coming in this week. And I'm not even talking about monetary. I'm just talking about seeing God fulfill His Scripture. Are you ready to give up on some stuff? I say, Brother Tom, I've tried some things and they just hadn't worked for me. Well, keep planting and keep waiting. Because God's going to bring that seed up. Because you can trust Him. You see that, what it says right there? It says, for in due time. You ever get bills in the the mail? They're due on a certain date. That's a negative. But your blessings are also due. Doesn't it say that? It says here, lose heart, for in due time we will reap. Disclaimer, if we don't grow weary, if we don't give up, keep pressing on for the Lord. Keep serving the Lord. Keep trusting the Lord. Keep putting Him first. And you watch. That seed's coming up. Whatever you've been trusting Him for, whatever you've been believing Him for. But the negative side to that as well, if we've been planting fleshly seeds, those bad boys will come up too. Say, what do I do, Brother Tim, if I've already planted them? Man, I'd this morning say, God, I am sorry. I have planted them, and Lord, I pray the best I can that those things, you would find some way to just have a crop failure. And Lord, I am going from this day forward to plant those spirit seeds. I'm going to be fanatical about them and I'm going to wait for your answer even. And the, what happens is we wait on the spiritual and when the spiritual doesn't happen, we shoot over to the flesh. Isn't that what Abraham did? I'm going to get a child. Wait, 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 not happen. Let's try the maid. And look what happened to that. Just got to wait on God. He would have delivered and he did. Later on, we got Isaac. But it wasn't God's time then. He gave up and said, I'm getting tired of waiting on this kid. Let's try something using my own brain. And what was it? Deception. We have to continue waiting. And so if you, ha- if you are waiting, keep waiting on the Lord to bring you your crop. Every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet.